Um, we invited Doreen King of Bordemona to speak on the peatland rehabilitation. Um, they're working as part of their uh, peatlands climate action scheme on, on their Bordemona peatlands. Um, Doreen's a project manager and a civil engineer, as I say, with Bordemona. She did her Bachelor of Engineering in what's now called the University of Galway. She also has a postgraduate diploma in environmental protection from Sligo. And I'll ask Doreen to join us now. Thank you. Thank you, Carl, and thanks to all the audience. Um, thanks for inviting me to, to give this talk. Uh, okay, well, look at I'll um, I'll start with giving a bit of background on uh, to Board Namon. I'm sure you're familiar with the company. So I suppose the, it was established in 1934 as the Turf Development Board, and then it was transformed into Board Namon in 1946. So it, it, the reason for its establishment was to develop Ireland's peace resources for the economic benefit of the state. So I suppose at its peak, it had over 6,000 direct employees. That would have been in the 1950s, currently there's 1,500. And then it would also create a lot of indirect employment. So it, it did provide, it was a big um, boost to the Midlands region mainly. So the peat um, was used generally for uh, energy generation, home heating, people gets, and for horticultural purposes. So I suppose Borden Mona would have prepared for the transition away from peat production would have commenced that preparation you know decades ago so we back in 1992 they constructed the first wind farm in Ireland and since then they've rolled out a number of other renewable energy projects they also got involved in waste collection and recycling purchase of AES and they also appreciated the the I suppose the need for bog restoration bog rehabilitation project so we de developed our first bio Biodiversity Action Plan in 2010. So in, in recent years, I suppose we faced um, additional challenges. The intention was that we would slowly ramp down our peat production, but um, in recent years, there was legislation for requirement to have planning permission for peat production where you're over 30 hectares. The Shannon Bridge and Lanesbury ESB power stations closed. Now the intention was that they would have been, uh, you know, been, um, jointly powered by biomass and peat, and there would be a gradual phase out of peat, but I suppose that didn't happen. Climate change recognition, peat is a high carbon fossil fuel, and then there was an increased awareness of the value of peatlands for carbon storage, biodiversity, and immunity. So in, in 2021, Board Namona made a decision to permanently cease peat production. And we now have a new vision of strategy that doesn't involve peat production, but it involves renewable energy recycling, waste management, carbon sequestration and biodiversity conservation. So I suppose it was a bit of a cliff edge when, when it did stop peat production. We had a lot of um, people employed in, in Borden Mona. And I suppose as a, as a part of the Just Transition, there was a scheme set up called the Peatlands Climate Action Scheme, also known as EDRAS, the Enhanced Decommission Restoration and Rehabilitation Scheme, just to avoid confusion. So the, the purpose of that was, the, I suppose the objective of that was to provide enhanced rehabilitation of 33,000 hectares. Borden Mona has a, has a land holding in total of 80,000 hectares. So this scheme is supposed to, to initially involve 33,000 hectares in 82 bogs over a four and a half to five year period. So it was initially um, funded through the climate action scheme, but it's it subsequently then with the EU kind of COVID National Recovery and Resilience Plan, that's where the funding now comes from. So it's funded by 108 million with board and amount of funding of 18 million. So the scheme was announced in November, 2020. Rehabilitation commenced on 18 bogs in April, 2021. The scheme it's managed by DEC, Department of Environment, Climate Communications, and it's regulated by the National Parks and Wildlife Service. So I suppose this is, the aim is that this would be a bog when um, peat production you know, finishes, that's our bare peat bog with our production fields. And then the intention is in time that you will end up with a rehabilitated bog. So the, the, I suppose the reason for the, the scheme, Bordemont operates under an IPC license. So we have an obligation to rehabilitate our peatlands. So what this scheme will do, it'll go significantly beyond what's required under that obligation to meet the EPA requirements. So it's, what we're doing is enhanced rehabilitation. So the objective is to optimize suitable hydrology for climate action benefits. So the aim is to maximize the wet residual peat footprint. So you want, we want to get soggy conditions. So we don't want deep water. 
sometimes it's unavoidable and we, we don't want a dry bog. So we want to create soggy conditions with water levels at or slightly above the surface of the peat. And the intention is to try and have that all year round or as close to all year round. So that will accelerate the development of vegetation, setting areas on a trajectory towards naturally functioning peatland and peatland habitats. I suppose dry bog emits carbon. So by wetting a bog it, to reduce the carbon emissions. So the enhanced measures, really what they're involved is the blocking of the production field drains, creation of low bonds to hold water, and the reprofiling, reprofiling of the peat fields to create <coughs> topography. So that image there is, it, you can see the, the square cells that um, they're created using low bonds just by pushing the peat to create, create these low bonds just to hold the water in areas to keep the bog wet. So the benefits, I suppose, the main benefits of the scheme is climate action benefits. So we increase carbon storage, reduce carbon emissions. So by rewetting the bog, you're securing the carbon that's in the peat that that's in the bog still, so, you know, which can be up to depths of five six meters in places. Reduce carbon emissions, and then acceleration towards carbon sequestration. So that's our key objective: climate action. It also supports the Borden Mona Midlands Just Transition, provides alternative employment to peat production. And then there are also additional ecosystem service benefits. So there's biodiversity provision, improved water quality, water flow attenuation, in that you don't get as flashy runoff if you get intense storms. You know, it, it, the water will still leave the bog, but they'll leave it in a slower manner because our, our drainage network that was in the bog has been, um, is, you know, the production field drains have been blocked and it's slower to leave the bog. Improved environmental stable landscape, which will, we don't have, the scheme does not include immunity, but it can support potential immunity projects and then improved environment for local communities. So the starting point is th these fields are production fields that are 15 meters in width. So Borden Mona would have, when they went into to drain a bog, back in the 40s and 50s and 60s, they would have um, cut drains 15 meter width and then each of those become a production field. Each field was cambered, I suppose. What they were trying to do is get the water off the bog as quick as possible. So the fields were cambered, they were higher in the center. And then um, all the surface water would just discharge through those drains, through a silt pond and then through an outfall. So in the enhanced measures, what we're doing is we're blocking those drains at regular intervals. We're reprofiling the production fields so we're, we're now again. These are these are the measures. Not all the measures are done on all the bogs. Depends on on you know every bog is different. But you're reprofiling the, the camber, so you you use the dozer to kind of flatten the field. Formation of cells using low peat berms, and the purpose of that is that you kind of terrace. You think the bog is flat, but it's not. So you're kind of trying to you know like paddy field kind of terrace, so the water goes steps down to the next one to the next one. Um. And all surface water will continue to discharge through silt ponds and the boundary drains around the bogs are not blocked. They will remain and they will remain functional. So that is, I suppose, what you're going from that dry bare peat bog to a rewetted bog. So the rehab measures used depend on the site characteristics and it's usually a combination of the above measures and it varies in each bog. So this is just, I suppose, the enhanced drain block and it's, it's as you can see there, it's keyed into the drain. So you, you kind of dig below the drain and then it's backfilled and compacted so that you, you kind of, there isn't a, still a flow path there. The whole thing is to block the flow path. Um, in formation of the cells, what we're doing is leveling so that you, with an overflow between each cell, so that you, you, you're kind of holding the water and then as I say, it moves to the next cell. So it's modification of topography, bonding and reprofiling. Again, it's all using the peat that's on the bog um, using a dozer to push it into the berms um, and as I say, still creating drain blocks underneath in the drains underneath those berms. So I suppose that's just, a, I suppose, gives you a picture of that cell just being formed there. With the, <coughs> and then that's, you can kind of see that's not quite finished. There's that, that channel there will have either a pipe or what we use are plastic sheet piles. So that we can co then control the water level, you know, you can, um, lower or raise it as required. But the, the whole purpose is that in each of those cells, you can kind of see the ground. Let me see. You can kind of see the, the ground kind of pick it up. It just shows that that is shallow water. That's not deep water. 
and the whole purpose is that you try and get a bit of a mixture, you know, where you have um, just water near the surface, really. And the purpose of the cells, as well as giving you a kind of a tiered effect, is the intention is to kind of encourage sphagnum growth on these deep peat bogs. And you, you don't want too much wave action. So that the berms as well will, you know, reduce any kind of wave action. So just in terms of what we've done to date, we've kind of two years, we're, we're sort of just finishing off our second year. So we've over 13,000 hectares rehabilitated to date on 38 bogs. And we've started some of our year three bogs now as well. So we're kind of at 40 bogs now. Yeah. And so we're commencing on an additional 14 bogs this spring, summer. So that gives you, I suppose, that map shows you the location. A lot of them are in Offaly, but also Longford, Galway, and Kildare, and Westmeath. So the purple are the year two and the yellow are the year one bugs. Um, so just some, I suppose, images of the rehab measures. Again, that's a bog in Karenstown, and um, that was taken about two years ago. Um, that, that is um, a bog. You can just see it gives you an indication of the scale. I suppose you can see the machines in the middle of the, the bog. I think this particular bog is about 300 hectares in size. Um, you can see the drains and the, the cells being formed. This is the bog up in Longford, and it's um, let me just you can see the drain blocks there. Uh, so that 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 bog would have been all drain blocks. That's the area of the bog with a couple of cells back here. And again, that's another bog with the cells. So you you can see here how the area you know it's beginning to re-wet up here. This is more recently done. They were still working on this bog at the time, so it's 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 just taking a bit of time to um to to uh, you know I suppose for for it to become saturated. And that's just a bog, I suppose, that's, that would have been, um, I suppose, out of production for a while. There's a bit of natural revegetation. And then we, we kind of did a few ex more kind of work in there. Now, again, you're not going to be undoing the vegetation that's there. So that type of bog, it would be drain blocks in appropriate places. And that's the bog cotton, which is, I suppose, a precursor of getting your, your sphagnum mosses then growing. So I suppose that for the design process for each of these bogs, you know, we'd have topographical surveys, aerial photography, LIDAR surveys. We do ecological surveys, habitat mapping. We then prepare rehabilitation plans, drawings, site characterization reports, drainage management plans, engineering specification. Um, so there's a lot of different reports. We do appropriate assessment on each individual bog. And we're required then if we do, if we do a screen and so if an NIS is required, that's and completed as well. And we also have a stakeholder engagement process. So all our packages are submitted to National Parks and Wildlife for approval. And then because we are licensed by the EPA, we have an IPC license, the, the rehabilitation plans also have to be approved by the EPA. Um, so stakeholder engagement, we have a website, we have um, draft rehabilitation plans they're uploaded to the website for consultation purposes. And then when they're finalized, they're, the, the final plans are uploaded as well. We deliver, we call to all residents within a kilometer of each bog. And we have emails and that we send out to stakeholders, um, appropriate representatives, farming organizations, community groups, NGOs, et cetera, with community liaison and officer. Um, and then any submissions or queries address, are addressed in the final rehab plans. Where an NIS is required, we have a newspaper advert um, and that's, yeah, everything uploaded to the website. So we have a lot of virtual meetings because I suppose this, this scheme started in COVID. We would have had, we've had at least over 60, I suppose we more now than that, um, meetings and presentations. And we also have had a lot of site visits. And then we have a lot of meetings with individual landowners. There was a lot of concerns in, initially. And there's still some with you know local farmers or landowners. So we would have a lot. We have a community liaison officer who goes out and, and our engineers go out as well and meet with the landowners generally in relation to drainage would be their 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 I suppose main concern. So just so I suppose for the the design process, um so regional, local, geological, geophysical, and hydrological data is considered for each individual bog. Um, so the dash sources, we would use Geological Survey of Ireland, Bedrock Geology, Aquifer Type, Groundwater Vulnerability Mapping, Chagas then, Soils and Subsoil Maps for the bog and surrounding area. And then we have other data sources, I suppose, unpublished. So LIDAR surveys. We flew all our bogs at the start prior to the commencement of the scheme um, for aerial imagery and LIDAR. Um, 
So we have ground penetrating radar information back from the late noughties on, uh, board, I suppose it was carried out to determine the peak depths in our bogs at the time. So by using the new LIDAR, the recent LIDAR with the old LIDAR, we can calculate the peak depths. We would have been in peak production since the GPR was carried out, but um, we, we can use it to determine the, um, the peak depths or add to our knowledge of peak depth. <laughs> Site-specific coring is completed as part of the pathometer installation. Um, we have uh, probably up around 50, 1,600 or so piezometers installed across our bogs at this stage. So they will um, detail the depth of the peat and also where they can, they'll get a sample of the subsoil underneath the peat. They, they're installed by hand, so it's not like they're, they're drilling right down into it or anything, but they will. Measurement of specific electrical con con SEC conductance that would just to give us an indication is the water, groundwater influence or um, rainwater. And I suppose that is relevant for, um, particularly for in sphagnum, I suppose you want the rainwater influence rather than the groundwater. And then estimates of hydraulic conductivity based on slope test. And so again, that's carried out in the selection of the bogs. So in addition to that, I suppose we look at the regional local drainage, the site topography, um, the land use and site infrastructure. You know, we would have <coughs> rail lines, we'd have, um, I suppose, structures, buildings that would have been there from, from Borden 1 as big production. Um, historical maps, just to, you know, um, particularly things like, um, you know, rivers and that that may have been diverted, or streams may have been diverted over the years. Current habitats and ecology, so there's a very, you know, in-depth surveys done of that. Any species of interest recorded on the site, and then statutory conservation designations, SACs, NHAs, etc. Then we constrain so things like public rights of way, turbary rights. While Borden Mona has installed peat production, there are some um, turf cutting carried out on our lands because third parties have turbary rights. They have a legal right to cut turf. So, um, you know, we that that we I suppose can't stop that. So that's still. Opinion. Um, archaeology, surrounding landscape then and current and future land use. So I suppose part of, you know, we, we RPS are also assist us in this development of these plans and they'd be involved in preparation of uh, drainage management plans for us. So, um, so the rehabilitation, the objectives then are set out for each bog area. So the objectives are going to be different depending on, on the particular, you know, each bog. So some, you might have promotion of sphagnum rich regeneration, you know, where you've deep peat. In other places, you're not, you might have shallow peat, groundwater influence. So what you'd be looking for is emergent wetland vegetation communities, plain reed beds, wet woodland. And then in other areas, you will have areas that will remain dry. You know, they're kind of headland, area, headland areas or higher levels that you're looking at kind of birch woodland on those. So we're not kind of saying you're going to get wet peat and sphagnum growing on every hectare of bugs. So just, I suppose, in relation to the hydrological monitoring, we have, um, I don't have the exact figure, but it's about 1,600 or so pizometers installed across our bogs. Generally, these, we would have a nest of pizometers, um, unless you're very shallow peat, we may not have a deep peat pizometer, but we have a phreatic and a, and a deep well pizometer. So um, they're installed and they've, Phreatic has the screen, 1.5 meter screen length and the deep then has um, screen length 50 centimeters and it's between the base of the peat and the underlying substrate. So that the pizometer gives us, it gives us, it gives us a baseline data because we install them generally a year. Now it just gives us a year. It doesn't, you know, we don't have years of data, I suppose, but it gives us a year before we do the rehabilitation of the water levels on that bog. And it can help us, you know, determine the impact of the rehab measures. So we can, you know, compare that with the data we have after the bogs as we monitor the pitometers remain in, in place after the rehabilitation. And then it, it, the, the pitometer nest enables vertical hydraulic gradient to be estimated and can identify if increased risk of vertical infiltration through peak to depth. So we want, we don't want to be doing intense rehab measures in an area that we'll have, we'll be losing the water through depth. So it does kind of help us determine that. So I suppose that map just shows the 
the spread of pizzometers in a particular bog. And you can see we have loggers in the, the, the yellow um, dots are pizzometers where we've automatic loggers. So where we've the manual loggers, they get dipped winter and summer. And in the, the other ones, then the, 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 where there are loggers, they get downloaded at the same time. So that gives us a lot of data and that can be compared then, you know, with rainfall levels, with and we can see the variability of the, the water levels in the bog. So I suppose um, the other things then we look at in design process, subpeat maps, the GPR, the LIDAR data, the K testing. So that tends to be very low and deep heat, suggesting very limited losses to depth for peat is deep. So we're finding that because the, the bogs, I suppose, over the years have been trafficked by machines, peat is probably quite consolidated. So we're, we're finding that, you know, the losses, when we do the, the, the slug test, the losses aren't and um, you know are fairly limited we, we kind of would have thought it, you know the, the deep peak measures would have been you know you want to be you know over two meters step but we're finding with the, even with 1.5 meters deep it's, it's um you know you're not losses are limited of water which is good so regional hydrology water balance modeling field hydrochemistry so we kind of talked about that so if, if we look at that's the the subsoil mapping and you can see that the limestone till is gray and then the pink is um, lagostrine clay. So I suppose where there's limestone till underneath underline and depending on your depth of peat, you kind of look at that carefully because you, again, you don't want to be losing um, water vertically. You don't want to be doing very intense measures there, you know, because I suppose the more intense measures, the more expensive the measures. So you want to be kind of, um, <coughs> you don't do very intense measures where you're at risk of losing water vertically. And um, the map on the right of the, sorry, the, um, the yellow and the blue shows the peat depths. And so you can see the variability across the bog that, that goes from greater than four meters, this is just a typical bog, to between, um, you know, one and two meters there. So I suppose there's a lot of different variables in the, in the, in the selection of the different types of rehab measures. So I suppose you bring together, or what we do is bring together the evidence from all the, the available sources to summarize the type of measures likely to be most effective. So where you have a thick se sequence of peat underlain by low permeability substrate with no upwelling and gentle vertical hydraulic gradients, then you would use these intensive deep heat measures like the cells with the, with the, um, the low burns. Less intensive measures might be suited, you know, where your topographical conditions are most favorable. Where you shallow peat, and a highly permeable substrate, steep surface slope, elevation, the bog, dry cutaway measures most suitable. And that would be drain blocks, but not as frequently drain blocks. You, you wouldn't have the reprofiling. Um, and then shallow peat, upwelling, groundwater, upper gradients, location topographic basin with contributing catchment, wetland measures most suitable. And in some cases, because of the way peat production would have been carried out, there, there is just a base and there's a low point there in, in the center of the bog. And sometimes that you, you just have wetlands. And, you know, that has its, um, you know, from a, it, that has advantages from biodiversity point of view. Um, it's probably deeper water than we would prefer, but sometimes it's unavoidable from a carbon point of view. So that just shows, that map just shows the variability of the different type of measures. So, it, they do vary across the bog. Um, that's just a typical example then of, I suppose, the drainage network because we have to look at the water still needs to leave the bog, so we need to kind of see what's the drainage path. And then for that, while well, it'll, it'll leave it, as, I suppose, a slower rate. And I suppose that drainage map just is an example of um, the, the green squares are the cells, and then the, the overflow, the, the blue arrows would be the location of each of the overflow points. So. Um, they're all determined and the level of those then is set out so that you can get your, your optimum water levels in each cell. Um, that just gives you, I suppose that top map there is a cross section. So it just shows the, um, you know, the variability of the levels across the bog. A bog isn't flat, you kind of think it is, but it's, it, but it's not. And then the LIDAR, the bottom right there is the LIDAR that again just shows the different levels. And then the bottom uh, is the subcatchments and the discharge points. So um, just for our 
design and implementation, we use um, ArcGIS We've, because of the spread of our lands and you know you're, you're kind of covering a big area it's it, everything is done on on gis we do use a certain amount of autocad but all the the rehab measures are once they're designed they're uploaded to the cloud and they're then um there's handheld gps tablets used on site so for verification of the works as they're carried out um <coughs> They're very useful because it can be difficult, you know, to locate yourself exactly. So it, it means every sorry, every cell is kind of individually identified, and then our engineers will go out and they'll kind of log, um, you know, what stage each of the works on the ground are at, um, and our operatives then can can you know also the area leaders also have these tablets that they can you know identify where they are and, and follow and know exactly. The right type of measures that they're using um, and then we track the progress of the bog using ArcGIS so it means that anyone can go in and or well it's about I think 40 people in board and one who have access to this go in and see progress today so you've got green means completed verified by the by the engineers orange means the operatives the operations board and one operations um, consider that it's completed and it's ready for inspection by the engineers. So, um, and then, you know, different different stages, gray means hasn't been started. So it just it means that we can then feed that into the tracker. So it, it's just a way of kind of following um, of, of tracking progress on the work. So just in terms of monitoring, um, RPS developed a dashboard for, for our loggers. So, um, or for RPS amateurs. So I suppose this is just a typical example that will give um, the data. Now, it, again, this is only just, I suppose, just getting set up and just in recent, you know, we're just really getting the data added to it now at this stage, but it's going to be very useful too because it'll, it'll give us the, the water levels over a period of time. You can see the across the bottom there, it goes from April up to May, and it's only one month. But you know, again, you can, you know, over whatever range you want and um, particularly where you have a logger. You know, not all pizzometers are loggers, but it, you know, we will also have the manual readings on this as well. So it's very useful information. And um, as I say, with the number of pizzometers we have there to be used. This is just a, a kind of typical sample pizzometer. Look, it's, it's one pizzometer in one bag, but it just gives an idea of, I suppose, the water levels. You can see. Well, you, you can, if you look at in July, 2021 water level was 400 mil below the ground level and then if you look in may to august of 2022 which was a very dry summer last year the water level is about 100 mil below and that's an optimum you know 100 mil below the surface is, is an optimum level that's a good result this is another example of the pisometer reading you can see the area circled that's I suppose when the rehabilitation commenced, you can see a kind of a, a jump in the water levels there. Then as the rehabilitation was just completed, water levels have stayed high, has risen, that's October. And then you can see how it's leveled off then in December as the rehabilit as, as the bog kind of stabilizes. Now I know that is winter as compared to summer, but I mean, you know, before that bog was rehabilitated, you wouldn't have had that level of water level. And again, that level is just above, it kind of, it's just above zero and then it kind of peaked. Now there was overflows needed to be added at that stage. So it probably got a little bit too high, but that has subsequently been done. Um, as part of our monitoring, as I said, we, we flew the bogs in advance of uh, the commencement of the rehab. And then what we did after the first year of rehab, they were flown again. And we'll do the same this summer. We'll fly the bogs that were rehabbed last year. So this is just a section of bog um, prior to rehab. And then that's just the same section. You can see the drain blocks and you can see the, the re-wetted area. Now, you know, it, it gives an indication. It also is a way of verifying, I suppose, the work that's been done, you know, that it's for a regulator. I think that they can then look at this and they know the number of drain blocks put in or the number that match with what was the design that can kind of compare with the design. And, you know, um, 
So I suppose the, the other um, area in terms of monitoring is carbon. So, uh, you know, the, the scheme is primarily a climate, a climate scheme. So it's really about climate benefits. So the carbon flux is, is a big key measurement for the scheme. So flux, it's, it's the change in the volume of carbon emitted sequestered over a specific time and geographical area. So it's sequestered a CO2 from plants, trees, and any other photosynthesis organized organism, sorry, carbon sequestered as CO2 from plants, trees, and other organisms is removed from the atmosphere. And then it's emitted to the atmosphere during respiration of CO2 from all living organisms. So these two balance each other out and determine if an ecosystem is a net sink or a net source. So that's your net ecosystem exchange, it's respiration minus photosynthesis. So I suppose that sounds very simple, but a lot of it, it depends on the types of plants, it depends on the time of year, it depends on daytime, nighttime, um, and it depends on, you know, your, your, your spread of vegetation on your bog. So other carbon sources then that from the bog is methane. So once we re-wet, we cre create oxygen deprived conditions and establish conditions of anaerobic decomposition. So you do get some methane emissions when you re-wet a bog. Now, it, you know, all the research says it is still preferential thing to do is to re-wet the bog. And the methane, the levels of carbon emitted, you know, if it's methane is a lot less than, um, than the carbon emitted, I suppose, from, um, from a dry bog, a dry peat, some dry peat. Other carbon sources then is dissolved organic carbon. So that, that would be in, in the runoff from, from the bog and the surface water runoff, and particular organic carbon. And DOC and POC are lost aquatically, but eventually are admitted to CO2. So there is another in the water, they eventually will make their way into the atmosphere. And then dissolved in organic carbon loss is not considered significant in acidic environments. So then that gives you your net ecosystem carbon balance. So it's a combination of all of those. So what we're trying to do is measure all of those. So, so how to estimate carbon fluxes now? It's not possible to measure them in every bog in every location. So what, what we're trying to do is develop emission factors. And there are some emission factors out there, but we're, I suppose, just focusing in on industrial peatlands um, using kind of research that's available and then also using our own monitoring data. So the emission factor by the land cover is the total emissions removal. And then to determine the emission factor is we measure greenhouse gases using combination of methods, including the flux tower. So, um, and then to determine land cover, future land cover, the survey map and characterize the vegetation, the area under study. So that would be the chemistry, hydrology and vegetation of that area. So the methods used to measure the carbon exchange. So an eddicovariance flux tower. So that measures CO2 and CH4 in real time. So we, we the scheme has two flux towers. Now these are expensive piece of equipment. They do measure um, a radius of about 200 meters. Well, they can measure up to 400 meters from, from the, um, you know, the center of the flux tower to measure a radius of that. So that will measure constantly 24 uh, seven, the carbon emitted from that bog. So we have two operation currently on bogs, not yet rehabilitated. <laughs> they'll then be rehabilitated and then they'll measure. So the whole, what we're going to do is have a year's data for a, a bog not rehabilitated. And then when it's rehabilitated, continue to measure so that we can compare the difference. Um, we also have closed manual chamber measurements. So that they are, um, if you can see the metal, the, the, the steel base at the bottom of that, that's put in place and it remains in position. And then our carbon technicians go out with, the, with this Perspex chamber and they place that over that steel square and they get a measurement of a point in time. Now that's done on kind of fortnightly basis, but it's just giving you, I think you take a measurement for about a minute or, and it just, you know, so it is at a point in time. And then um, we also have some flumes to measure the DOC fluxes and the water retention rates. And we have spot water samples, all our water and water samples are measuring DOC as well. So that's just the location. It gives you an example of the, the variability in the locations for our closed chamber measurements. You can see you have different types of vegetation, you have bare peat, um, and you know, th there's a lot of variability across the bogs. And what we're trying to do is predict, 
you know, we can measure the bare peat, but then you also want to predict what will your carbon emissions be when um, the vegetation develops on the bog and, and then determine the type of vegetation likely to develop on that. Uh, surface water monitoring. So we've monthly sampling of surface water discharges on 82 bogs and they're the parameters that are monitored. So that would be well in excess of what we're required to, to sample under our IPC license. And then we flow monitoring at sample locations. Archaeological monitoring is, um, we carry out an archaeological impact assessment um, prior to, to rehabilitation and we would buffer out any known archaeology. We, we don't, we have, we, we don't disturb that. But by rewetting it, you are preserving it. So, but even you know, we, we rehabilitate around it, then it will um, preserve it. And the National Monument Service are carrying out some monitoring while we're doing the rehabilitation as well on some of our bugs. Um, we also do quite a bit of uh, biodiversity monitoring. So it's uh, by our by um, Board of Money Colleges. So it's kind of standardized scientific approach. They will have set routes that they'll walk and then they'll observe and record what they see and then they'll walk the same route again and then record that. So look, it includes vegetation, habitat mapping, permanent quadrants, indicator species, the bog condition, and then pollinator, you know, the biodiversity, pollinators, wintering birds, breeding birds. So look at that's just a sample of the type of thing that that, that we're seeing now in our bogs. Um, this is a, a bog that was never in production it was a high bog we drained years ago but never went into production so we went in and drain blocked it and i suppose this is just some of again what's been observed marsh fertility is a, a butterfly that's a listed species um butterfly orchid um this is a, another bog that again has revegetated naturally but we've gone in and done some additional rehab in it so lapwing black at a gull ringed plover red shank um We've observed on um, Kilmacshane Bog, it's, it's along the River Shannon, internationally important numbers of whoop response. That's the first winter post rehabilitation. And then the Eurasian crane, um, those four breeding attempts from 2019 to 2022, and the first chicks fledged last year. So our ecologists were very excited about that. So, so the rehabilitation will create you know, further habitat for this species. Look, that's just. A video of the cranes just give you kind of an idea of the size of them they're quite impressive that's the two parents with the two chicks you can see there's a chick at the bottom in the lower along the rail line so i haven't seen them myself but uh, they're quite impressive So this just is an example. There's a lot of research going on, I suppose, um, you know, on our bogs. Um, so I suppose that just gives you an example, Trinity, and, and then I know some people here were talking about some of these research projects. Um, so there's a lot of data going to be becoming available. And I suppose we, you know, we are supplying data to each of these projects as they request them. Um, there is a, Two other flux towers on board and bogs as part of research projects so we're kind of sharing their data as well and um so we, we'll have four flux towers data from four flux towers in total which is good um so just i suppose th this rehab is carried out as well and you know along with other projects this is um mount lucas wind farm and you can you can see the infrastructure the road infrastructure we can see the significant areas in between all that road infrastructure and you can see how it's re-wetted so we are this is another bog we went into this year which is Cloncreen wind farm and we went in again and re-wetted the areas in between the infrastructure and it is significant areas and it is um not beneficial just some images then i suppose just to give you i suppose a view of the bog within the landscape that's bog down in county offaly you can kind of see how it's rewetted and the surrounding land not impacted because the, the, the drains are um, kept open. This is the bog, this is the, the dry bog we would have seen earlier. That's that's it this year. Not quite finished, but nearly there. Again, this is just some cells being formed. Um, and you can see how it's the ones that are completely have rewetted and the other ones are, are not quite there yet, but you can see how they, you know, if you look at, you can see here there's a production fields no rehab has been done and you can see how how dry they are compared to 
when it's been re-wetted or the, the cells have been formed, just some more cells. And again, that's that bog um, in Kelly's Grove, the high bog that didn't, wasn't in production. You can see the drain blocks in the machines. Um, this is Clon Cream Wind Farm. So you can see the road infrastructure and then the re-wetted bog in around that. Some more photos of that. This is another high bog and I suppose that's ideal conditions there really. You know, that this is another bog that was drained and never went into production. So we've, we've put in drain blocks here and here and you can just suppose that's the ideal kind of water levels. And again, that's the same bog. And just to, I suppose if you look down here, it, you, can, you can kind of see the water there and then you can see down here where it hasn't been blocked and you can just just even notice a difference in, in, in the water levels of how effective I suppose the drain blocks are at keeping the water on the bog. And that's just another bog in um, Uchter where it had naturally vegetated but it was a bit dry. So these berms and these berms are here just to kind of hold the water back and then we have drain blocks here as well. So just to, to, to make that just wetter and reduce the, the dry feet. That's just for further information. We have um, a website, bnmpcast.ie, and that is all that rehabilitation plans, and that is you know other information, and then it has a, an email address and, and a, a community liaison number. Um, we also do work on um, national parks and wildlife for what, other bogs other than Borden and Mona bogs. So that's there's just slightly different, I suppose. If you look at sorry. Um, these would be kind of SACs. So there'd be areas where there's there's the high bog is still, so you can see this is all high bog here, but this would have been turf cutted. So that's all ceased then as part of um, you know, either compensation or relocation. The turf cutters were moved out. So if this then is it's re-wetting of that to kind of um it'll benefit this area, but it'll also benefit the high bog as well to try and get that back to. And this would be similar as well. So these are slightly different, I suppose. It's it's these burns depending on the topography, um, and I suppose that's um, all. Same as mentioned earlier, that would be that type of rehab. So that that's uh, six bogs have been rehabilitated under this scheme. That's all. Same actually there that one. Yeah. So just I suppose from Borden and I suppose that you know the professional service capability we've built up quite a team now of, of expertise in this area. So for design approval and implementation and monitoring, um, that is the kind of services we provide. Okay, thank you. I